I'm now going to introduce our speaker, Bruce. Um, Bruce and I know each other from quite a while back. I went to, I did my PhD at UC Santa Cruz, which is where Bruce teaches in a different department. And one time he did call me up. I don't know if it was me directly, but I ended up going to his house and checking out a dead deer on his lawn and trying to figure out if it was a mountain lion who killed it. I don't know if you remember that, Bruce, but I think we decided it was probably a coyote. And we thought that coyotes were maybe using the fence as a way to get that deer cornered so that it could attack it. But Bruce, he's a really awesome guy, really great speaker. He's a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC Santa Cruz. And his research focuses on social behavior and social signals in birds. So Bruce has been studying the winter ecology and social behavior of migratory golden crown sparrows um, in the UCSC Arboretum for the past 17 years. And if anyone hasn't been to the Arboretum, it's a really cool place to visit. More recently, he's been studying within species brood parasitism in wood ducks near Davis, California. Most of Bruce's previous work has involved breeding birds, including a long-term study of American coots in British Columbia, as well as studies of lark buntings on the Colorado prairies and black-headed ducks in the marshes on the pampas of Argentina. For his master's at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Bruce studied parental care and snow buntings in the high Arctic of Canada, while his PhD research at Princeton University focused on brood parasitism and parental care in American coots in British Columbia. I remember learning a lot about brood, um, brood parasitism from his work and his grad students' work. So now I'm excited to hear about the little sparrows. So Bruce, I think you can steal the commands and okay. take it away. All right. So that's my title, uh, The Sparrows in the Mist, Complex Winter Social Behavior of a Little Brown Bird. Uh, the name will become clear, or the title will become clear, uh, but, and there's a couple of different reasons for choosing this. It really is foggy in the Arboretum often, so we often are watching Sparrows in the Mist, uh, although these days I suspect it's going to be Sparrows in the Smoke. Uh, we'll see how the Sparrows like that. Um, the title also comes from, many of you will remember this famous movie about Diane Fossey going off to Africa to work on social behavior of gorillas. And uh, so I, I like the sort of the parallels and it also allows me to uh, imagine if a movie were made about the sparrows. And so here we have sparrows in the mist. Um, and you'll notice that uh, Diane Fossey went a huge distance to study a poorly known uh, organism and I went a full three minutes from uh, my house to the Arboretum, it's very close. And so it was, it was, oops, excuse me, I'm getting a phone. Okay, I will just, um, and it was a big sacrifice because they don't have coffee in the Arboretum. And so the bottom line here is that some people say I didn't go far enough. Um, but humor aside, there will be, well, I'll connect this back in the end. There are some actual parallels between what people have found for primates and what we found for our birds. Um, and that reminds me to give a nice thanks to the Arboretum. They um, not only provided this incredible garden that is perfect habitat for uh, sparrows, uh, they gave us logistic support at times, banding offices, and just made life very easy, easy for us. So it was, a, it was a great study area. And because it's right on campus, uh, it has the added bonus that we were allowed to uh, have a bunch, a whole bunch of undergrad students volunteer with us because it's right on the university campus. And so uh, that was an added bonus of working so close to home. I just want to thank people at the, at the start. Um, this project actually started as a, a, a laboratory exercise in a class. And we started looking at the sparrows. And then my two former PhD students, Dai Shizuka and Alexis Shen said, we should just keep, we should ban them and maybe study them. So they, they actually motivated the study uh, in many ways, and we, we have been collaborating for the past uh, 17 years and continue to collaborate. And as I said, lots and lots of uh, volunteer undergraduates, to my count, it's up to 70 now. Uh, one PhD student, Theodora Block, and then a few people from the community, Inger Marie Larson and Jenny Anderson have been helping us for almost the 20 years, and I consider them as almost principal investigators. They know as much about the birds and the project as we do. So they've, it, it's been invaluable to have their help. Migratory birds are kind of interesting in many cases, especially songbirds, because they undergo a personality change between seasons. 
So if you were to go to Alaska or the Yukon and study golden crown sparrows, you would find that they're not really very social. Males defend territories, attract a female, and then the pair works to uh, raise a family, but there's really not much sociality uh, beyond the family groups. They then migrate down into that orange area shown on the map here, um, and then they fundamentally change their behavior and become quite social, and they live in flocks uh, in the winter. And um, as was pointed out, I spent most of my life studying reproduction in birds, uh, sexual selection, mating systems, and that's true for the field in general. I think biologists are obsessed with sex, so we know a lot about the breeding uh, aspects of their lives. We actually know relatively little about the details of social organization in wintering uh, migratory birds. It was uh, uh, appalling how little we know about some of the details. And so that was the motivation uh, for doing this work, was just to find out about details for which the field is missing. Uh, pretty basic information. And I'm a behavioral ecologist, which means I'm interested in the evolution of behavior, or put another way, thinking about behavior as adaptation. And so that's how and why individuals benefit from particular behaviors and features. And so that's an underlying theme in much of what uh, I study, and particularly in this study as well, which is why would they be doing this? Uh, and in some cases, it's not why are they doing this, what are they doing? We know so little that in some cases, before we can get to the why they do it, it's what are they doing? And so that's just kind of the, the, the perspective that I bring to most of my studies is a, is a mix of behavior and evolution. So here's the bird. And when you look at, uh, when you study adaptation in populations, the way you do that is by following individual organisms. And in birds, we do that by giving individuals unique color band combinations. So there is only one bird in our population that has violet over orange, violet over metal band. And that means that whenever we see this bird, we know who it is. It's like a social security uh, number. And so we compile data sets on individuals and follow them um, within years. And as you'll see uh, across years as well. And so that's key is the focus on individuals and what the individuals are doing and in many cases, the variation among individuals in the population. So what I'm gonna do is go through a little bit of sparrow biology. But again, um, we're looking at social behavior in winter, and that means keeping track of color banded individuals. And I will give you more details on that. So why live in a flock? In terms of like a behavioral ecology perspective, there's benefits and costs of living in a flock. And one of the benefits is you reduce the chance of this happening. This is a sharp-shinned hawk. There's lots of hawks that like to eat birds. And by living in groups, uh, birds are able to um, reduce the risk of predation, uh, often by having lots of eyes watching out and having an alarm system where everybody flees to cover. If you've watched uh, uh, golden crown sparrows, you'll note that they often forage close to bushes. And if they get frightened, they flee very quickly uh, into the bushes. There's also costs of living in a flock, which means you have to share food or compete for food. So here we have two golden crown sparrows competing over a, a food pile. And so this is, this is seen as sort of a general problem, not just for golden crown sparrows, but for all sort of small songbirds in winter. It's called the small bird in winter paradigm. And most of these small birds live in social groups and the fundamental drivers of those are the benefits of avoiding predators and then all of the competition that comes with having to share food among flock members. And so here's an example. Here's a bird at a seed pile and one bird is in the middle of the seed pile hogging the food. And um, one thing I want to point out is the diet of golden crown sparrows is a bit unusual. They eat seeds, but when they're not eating seeds, uh, they're vegetarians. They eat nectar, they eat flower petals, and they eat grass. And this is a really uh, unusual uh, diet for a small bird. We're used to cows and Canada geese eating um, grass, uh, not so much small birds. So we, we've often wondered whether this weird diet might have something to do with some of the complexities in their social behavior. We do everything spatially. So when we go out and watch color banded birds, we have a, a map 
a gridded map that you can see individual plants on and bushes. And so that allows us to spatially locate all observations. And as you can see, if you can see my marker, each of these yellow dots is a feeding station. We've used the same feeding station for many years so the birds become familiar with them. And so these are used both for areas where we watch social interactions, and these are also areas where we're able to trap the birds because they know that they're gonna find food there. And so here's how we trap the birds. This is a potter trap. And we put these at the places where the birds know their seed. And on days we want to trap them, so they have to go in the traps to get fed. And you can see a little treadle here. And that treadle, uh, when the bird hops up to go in behind the treadle to get to the seed, the latch on the door closes and the door closes on the bird. And so we, that's a, it's a very nice way to, to catch birds. And golden crown sparrows in particular are very, very easy to catch in potter traps. So from a logistics sense, these birds are, are very easy to work with. And to date, we've actually banded 1,600 birds. And that doesn't count birds that we've uh, banded off our study area for, for uh, experiments. Um, and what's really interesting is that there's a fairly high return rate. A bird this year has a 40 or 50% chance of returning across years. And we think what that means is birds are very, very faithful to their winter grounds. And if they're alive, they will come back. And I should point out that when we catch the birds, we do lots of measurements. So we weigh them, we measure their wing size, their leg size, their body mass and we take pictures of their head, as I'll show you in a second, to look at their plumage characteristics. So the first time we catch a bird, and every subsequent year, we get lots of measurements. And so that goes into our database and is connected to their individual uh, records as known by their uh, color bands, the uh, color band combination. And also here, you can see, in case you're not familiar with banding, uh, banding stations, metal bands have a unique band. So if the bird were to lose color bands, there's still, an, you still know who that individual is because each metal band has a unique uh, identifying number. One of the things that you realize uh, working with golden crown sparrows is, in winter is there's phenomenal variation in their plumage. And I noticed looking through the uh, list of participants that there's a couple of people from Point Blue. Rita Caldwell has worked on this extensively and published, and so our work is building on hers. And Diana Humple is also uh, doing work on golden crown sparrows up at Point Blue. And so we're not the only people to be looking at these sorts of things. And we're building on the lovely earlier work from many people. But this is kind of interesting. And if you were to work on these birds in summer, you would not see this kind of variation. So they go from being not much variation in plumage in summer to tremendous variation in winter. What you're hearing now is a song of a golden crown sparrow. And alarm chips. These birds sing a lot in winter uh, and fall, and so you actually know that fall is here because uh, these are the harbingers of, of fall. When the sparrows show up, you can hear them singing in your backyard, and I imagine that many of you will recognize this. Um, and so these are just some basic sort of background things that will motivate the questions I'm going to address uh, in just a second. And then once we started tagging the birds, uh, we realized we could actually figure out who flocks together because they don't hide in bushes. They feed out in the grassy areas next to the bushes. And so it's pretty easy to watch birds and figure out which birds are hanging out together at any point in time. And our initial observations suggested that they might be doing something interesting with their flocking. And so that became, became a question. So that motivates, uh, the back, that background information motivates the three questions that I'm gonna talk about today. And we're doing other things as well. But the questions today uh, will be, is the crown plumage a competitive signal? These birds vary tremendously in the amount of yellow and amount of black on the tops of their heads. And there's reasons from other species to suggest that this could be a signal that they use in competition over food. The second question was, why are these birds singing in winter? who's singing and why. Birds sing in summer for breeding, so it's kind of unusual to have them singing in winter. And uh, uh, once we started watching uh, color band individuals, it became clear that songs, pretty important to these guys, but 
pretty hard to understand what's going on. And then finally, perhaps the most basic question that we wanted to ask is, what, what is their social organization? We know they live in flocks, but the flocks, are they permanent? Once you see, once you see birds in a flock, is that who they hang out with all the time? Or uh, do, uh, does flock composition vary? And is there some sort of structure uh, to the communities uh, when you start teasing apart uh, who flocks together and, and how stable those flocks are? So let's start with the first question. Does crown variation function as a signal? Again, here's a, a, a slide showing that, that kind of variation. And birds vary both in the amount of the black plumage on the top of their head and the amount of yellow plumage. And the reason we thought that it could be a signal is there's some pioneering work on a close relative of the uh, golden crown sparrow. It's, it's the same genus. This is the Harris sparrow. And this was done by, uh, probably, I guess, almost 50 years ago now by a museum worker by the name of Sievert Rohr. And he was collecting birds for a museum in Washington state. And he noticed instantly that there was a massive variation in the bib. So if you can look at the bib, some Harris sparrows had a ton of black plumage on their breast and other ones had almost none. And that struck Sievert Rohr as really kind of bizarre. And so he proposed that plumage patch variation could signal fighting ability in flocking species. These guys have to compete over food. It's winter, there's not a lot of food, and if they have to fight over every morsel of food, that could get kind of costly. And so Sievert Rohr proposed and then showed with some nice experiments that the amount of black plumage that these birds have relates to their fighting a darker plumage bib would be socially dominant and other birds could actually just figure this out by looking at each other. So we wanted to test this idea that variation in plumage patches might serve a similar purpose in golden crown sparrow, namely that it might correlate with social dominance. And here we have a golden crown sparrow showing off its sexy head. This is a very bold bird with lots of yellow and lots of black. And they often do display their, their heads to each other. And so the way we uh, figured this out is when we catch the birds to ban them or uh, remeasure them when they're returning birds from previous years, we take a photograph. And it's very easy in Photoshop to extract just the pixels that are black or just the pix pixels that are gold and then Photoshop will tell you how many pixels you have. And you can get an exact estimate of the area of black plumage on a bird's head and an exact estimate of the amount of gold. And so for each band of bird each year, we have an estimate of its plumage uh, characteristics. And we can then start to ask, how who do they win fights over? How do they, how do, they do in competition uh, over food? And the way we do that is two different ways. We put seed piles out and the birds interact. And in some cases we get actual interaction. So here's a bird that's usurped. It came in and uh, basically replaced this fleeing bird at the seed pile. And sometimes they chase them away and sometimes they fight and we can determine uh, who wins that fight. More subtle is sometimes it seems like nothing is happening, but here's a bird with a very bold crown hogging the seed pile. And here's a bird with a wimpy crown just watching, wishing it could eat at the seed pile. We call this avoidance. And what that means is this bird on the right is not challenging the bird on the left. So we know that this bird, wimpy bird is subordinate and this bold bird is dominant because if the tables were turned, the dominant bird would not be polite like this. It would chase the other one away. And so we, again, to stress, we have two levels of figuring out who's dominant, some that involve actual aggression and other ones that involve basically nothing but the failure to challenge another bird at the seed pile. And we collected lots of information at seed piles and we asked, um, and we did then explored whether at, in this observational setting, whether plumage correlates with dominance. And it did. Birds with bigger black or bigger gold patches were socially dominant. They won more often against opponents who had less black 
or less gold. And these things worked independently. So it's not that you have to have both. Both of these uh, things work um, independently. But what was interesting is that the gold in particular played a role in avoidance in a way that black didn't. So if birds were really unmatched in the yellow, then you would see the dominance being settled by avoidance. Um, and what happened is if birds escalate, then often the black plumage would determine uh, who was dominant. So a fairly complicated sort of signaling system. Now, as I pointed out, this was all done just observing birds at seed pots. And there's problems with uh, observational studies uh, like this because correlation does not mean causation. We showed that plumage correlates with dominance, but there are other things that could have actually been driving this. For example, we know that patch size correlates with body size. Bigger birds, heavier birds tend to have bigger crown patches. And so the question then is, are they winning fights because of their crown signals or are they winning fights because of their body size? And there's other things uh, as well. These birds know each other. They, as, as we'll see when we get to the last part of the talk, they're very familiar with each other. And so if you've got birds that are familiar with each other, they might already know. For example, Betty here might know that uh, Mary is dominant to her. And so you need experiments to control for these kind of confounding and um, confusing variables. And so the way that we did that is we captured birds from two different places, Poganip and up Empire Grade, to ensure that the birds had never met before, they don't know each other, and then we manipulated their plumage. And so these are two birds, they were matched to have similar crowns. We flipped a coin and then said, one of you gets to be studly. So this bird won the coin toss, heads, you get a nice dark head. And so this bird got a black addition to its head, and then we put them in this aviary here on the right and the birds are totally happy being in an aviary and then they act uh, very much like they do out in the field. They basically compete for the little seed pile here and they tell us who is dominant. And we did this for two different experiments. We did a separate experiment on the blackbirds and then on the black patch and then we did a separate uh, second experiment where we enlarged the gold uh, on, on the bird. And again, birds were, were chosen randomly. And so if the plumage patch is not important, then it should be a random draw between which bird wins. And that, as we'll see in just a second, that basically sets up some pretty simple statistical analysis. We've got two birds. And if it's random, it's just like a coin toss. So heads, I win, uh, tails, you win. And so if our manipulations have no effect on dominance, each bird in a trial has a 50-50 chance. And so we can just do basically coin toss statistics to ask, did the outcome differ from random? Random expectation is that 50% of the experimental uh, birds should win and 50% of the control individuals should win, but that's not what we saw. What we saw is 14 out of 15 of the black patches, the enlarged black patch won, and similarly, almost all of the birds that we manipulated, the gold patches, they were dominant. And so if you think about a coin toss, if you toss 16 heads in 17 tosses, that's not a random coin. So we concluded from this that the birds really are using these plumage traits to determine social dominance. Now, a question that many of you are thinking is like, wait, how are these birds doing that? We've given uh, Bill here a nice, nice dark brow. How does Bill know what's going on? Because he doesn't have a mirror. And that's an interesting, oh, um, before I get there, in some plumage is a signal dominance. Black and gold may signal different information. Um, and this is, the, this is the point I want to make is like, how do they know? And it turns out there's a search card games that work in the same way. There's a, ga there's a game called Oklahoma Forehead Poker where the players aren't allowed to see their own cards. They're allowed to see everybody else's cards. And we think that this may be going on. What's happening, we think, is that the, the bird we've manipulated 
doesn't know that it's been manipulated, but the birds that it's uh, up against change their behavior. So a wimpy bird that's made to look dominant, all of a sudden is treated with respect by its opponent. And so it, it then changes its behavior in the same way that the card players would look at their opponent's cards and make decisions about themselves. So this is, a, this is a now Oklahoma forehead poker, uh, golden crown sparrow size style. Moving on to the second question, um, why do golden crown sparrows sing in winter? And we're still just working on this, so I'll briefly just talk about a little bit of what we've done. This is some, uh, a project we're working on the data right now, so I don't have a lot of the answers, but we have some preliminary results. So why would birds sing in winter? Uh, well, one possibility is it's young males practicing for summer. We know from famous studies of white crowned sparrows that yearling males uh, hear on the breeding grounds the parents and neighbors singing and they store that information. And then when they get down um, into areas like this, they start to practice in fall. This is well known. And early fall is when young male golden, uh, white crowned sparrows sing. And that's how they learn to sing their songs effectively is by practice. So this is a hypothesis that maybe these singers in golden crowned sparrows are yearling birds, males that are just practicing their song just as they're closely related uh, uh, relatives, the golden crowned, uh, uh, the white crowned sparrows do. Alternatively, uh, in some birds like Townsend solitaires and European robins, birds will sing in winter because they defend strict territories just as they do in summer. And so uh, solitaires defend territories to get at juniper berries and, and uh, they sing in winter. Uh, and so this hypothesis predicts that singing would be associated with strict territoriality, either one or two birds defending resources in winter. And then as a vague alternative, which we will develop as we get more information, is perhaps singing serves some other function. Uh, and so this is sort of a catch-all for it's not males practicing and it's not winter territorial defense. So briefly, what do we know in terms of uh, our pilot studies? Only some birds sing not all birds sing. And in that, in fact, it might be as low as 10% in some years. And singers love to sing hidden in bushes. So they're a pain in the butt to try and, and, and see their leg bands. So we often see birds singing, but we don't know who they are because they're very good at hiding. So it's taken us a while to get a good data set on the identity of known singing birds. Song is most common early in the season when they're getting back and it trails off, it's basically, we, we hear very little singing after about mid-December. Mid Both sexes sing, and if anything in our population, females may sing even more than male. And my, co, uh, my collaborator, Dai Shizuka, has studied sparrows in Alaska on the breeding grounds, and females do not appear to sing in, in summer, so it's pretty weird. Females, at least, are only singing in winter. So we can reject the males singing to learn their songs as the only explanation for why these sparrows sing in winter. And it turns out that based on our banding data, most singers tend to be returning birds. They're not yearlings at all. So it seems that it doesn't really have too much to do with young birds learning to sing. And then in terms of the second ter uh, hypothesis about strict territoriality, Singers live in, in, in groups of birds. They're not defending territories. So the song does not have to do with the strict defense of territories, although there may be some group territoriality aspects going on, but it's not sort of a classic a bird or a pair of birds defending, defending a territory. And I'm gonna point out, now this is a, a video. There's one form of singing that's really interesting that suggests to us that it's that song may be really important for structuring the winter social communities. We call this tethering, and we see this early in the fall, and it's usually returning birds. And these, it's like a song duel. For those of you that know the voice, it's like a pair of singers, and they can sing at each other for an hour, sometimes two or three hours. And we call it tethering because these birds will stick to each other like glue, singing back, back and forth and back and forth. And we don't yet know what this is about, but it seems like it's, there's, there's 
determining some sort of boundaries, not necessarily a, a physical boundary, it could be a spatial boundary. So you'll see these two birds uh, there, one of them singing, hopping around. They flick their wings and tails as though they're agitated. They're sort of feeding, but not really so interested in feeding. That's the second one singing. He had a two-syllable one, so one of the birds had a one-syllable song. So the, typically they both sing and interact, and it's it's pretty astonishing. It just goes, it can go on for a very, very long time and seem very intense. So this is one form of singing, but they also they also just have singing in, in bushes, as I said. So uh, we're paying attention to the context of the singing. But we have some preliminary um, evidence that we're following through on now is that singing is related to social dominance. For example, here we have two sparrows, Brenda and Judy. And you might look at Brenda and say, wow, she's got a lot of black, she's gonna be dominant. But what we found is in some cases that singing can trump plumage. We can actually find birds being more dominant if they're singing than you'd expect based on their, on their plumage per se. And so we're, we're now drilling down and looking at this in, in a little more detail now, but singing we think is related to dominance and not just dominance over food. It may be about who gets to be in a group or rival uh, communities or something like that. But we, we think there's something pretty exciting going on with this singing. Last but not least, what is the pattern of social organization? Um, the question then is, um, we know that these birds live in flocks, but studies of individuals in flocks of lots of different species has shown that the structure of flocks can vary between two extremes. You can have completely random flocks, which means that on a given day, different individuals come and go and there's no real structure, that basically individuals will just join any flock. They're not hanging out with friends or anything like that. And these sorts of random flocks have been shown in some groups like sandpipers. On the other end of the extreme are things like cooperative breeders. These are Galapagos mockingbirds. And my friend Andrew Berry took this rather spectacular photograph. What you see here are two long-term social groups that live together for most of their lives and they're at a territory. So what they're doing is they've drawn a line in the sand and these two uh, neighboring social groups are fighting over the territory border. But if you were to color band these mockingbirds and go back day after day, it would always be exactly the same individuals. So the exact opposite of sandpipers, here we have extreme social facility, uh, social fidelity and very, very stable root structure over time. So those are the ends of the spectrum and you can get variations within. And so what we found with the, uh, golden crown sparrows is when you go out on a given day and watch a flock, if you go back the next day, some individuals in the flock may be the same, but some uh, have left. And so these are called fission fusion dynamic. So we know right away that these are not like the Labagas mockingbirds. There's some kind of uh, movement between flocks. The question was, are these flocks completely random or is there some structure to the uh, flocking? And to get at that, uh, we use a, a, a method called social networks. And I'll explain that with the sparrows, but basically you get lots and lots of observations of flocks, or in the case of sea lions, groupings. And over time, you then put all those groupings into a database and you ask, is there a pattern? Do some individuals tend to socialize with each other more than others? And in the case of the Galapagos sea lion, you get these little groupings, you get really clear communities of individuals that interact with each other, but not with the other groups. And so you have a gray group here, you have a blue group, a red group. And so you have these groupings and these groupings are also occupying different areas. And so we, we might think of this as something like the Galapagos mockingbirds a little bit. Um, but again, this is how we're going to uh, figure out what the golden crown sparrows are up to is to use this social network uh, approach. And this is very much like people look at traffic, uh, connections between airports or how many friends you have on Facebook. It's a very powerful way for looking at connections between uh, things uh, that people are now using. Uh, and it's ideal for 
asking about social behavior. And so I'll just give you really a couple of really uh, brief look at what we're doing. When you make a network, you're getting observations of pairs of individuals, all pairs of individuals in your population. And what you're looking at is, so let's say we have 100 flocks where either this bird or this bird occurred in, sometimes together, sometimes not together. And an association index is the fraction of all flocks when these two birds were together. So if they were always together, then 100% of the flocks uh, that you observed at least one of these birds in, they would have been together. And so that would be a very strong bond. And when you look at these networks, it's the thickness of the line. And so the thicker the line, the better the friends they are. And so, and then all of those pairwise combinations are put together to look for bigger structure. So here's a case where you get a thick, these are, this connects these two birds, a thick line. It's a fairly strong bond. Here's a case where you might have a weak bond. Maybe they were only together in 10% of the flocks as opposed to 80%. And then for some individuals, you may never ever see them together in flocks. And so there's no bond. And so that's, that's how to read these sort of graphical outputs of social networks. And that raises the question, what's a flock? Uh, the birds don't say, hey, I'm in a flock with this person. We have to objectively figure out what a flock is. And so we, use, after watching the birds for a while, we figured out that birds within a 10 meter radius, we called, uh, at a given point in time, we call belonging to the same flock. And so we have here two flocks. This is just a call we made. They, uh, it's it's uh, arbitrary, but it turned out that it yielded some pretty interesting patterns. So there's something to, we were picking up something about um, the bird. And actually, if you look at, if you start to look at the birds, it captures pretty much birds that are hanging out together for a given point in time. And so here's an example of the data that go into one of our networks. You would go out and actually this shows four time units. We actually have sometimes 200 or even a thousand different flock observations. So here's a flock. We look at all the band of birds in the flock. They're all connected. Come back another day and we might find some of these birds at a different location and we have a, another flock here. Another time, three birds and then another time, four birds. And sometimes the birds are together and sometimes they're not. And so what the, the network would look like, because these are all color coded. So note, here's a bird, red, yellow. Red, yellow is seen in three of these flocks. If we go, oops. So now here's, here's a network that shows the strength of the bond. Red, yellow, and green, orange. When they were seen, they were seen together a lot. So that's a very strong, those guys are friends. Here's a weak connection between yellow green and uh, pink red, I guess that is, yeah, purple red. Uh, and then some birds were never seen in flocks. So blue green and purple red were never seen in a flock. So that's, that's sort of what we're, what we're aiming for, but with real data. And this is what we found. So in the first year we looked at this, we found evidence for three clear communities. I won't go through the details, but you get social network analysis doesn't just look at strengths between individuals. It finds way to ask, are there non-random clusters of individuals that tend to associate more than you'd expect by chance? And that's what we found is really uh, very clear evidence for three non-random clusterings of, uh, of birds. And we refer to these as communities. And what this means is that even though flock membership can change over time, where the members from uh, flocks come from is not random in the whole, arboret whole arboretum, but the flocks are coming and going from the same community. So when you look at, for example, flocks in this area here, 90% uh, of the time members in flocks would be uh, coming from this pool from the same community, even though the composition in a given flock might change. And it turned out, as with the sea lions, there's a geographic component to that. So the three communities that we found also use different parts of the arboretum. This is the, the map I showed you earlier of our study area. 
and you can get some sort of contour maps of where those uh, communities are 50% of the time in this area here. And what this tells you is the different communities are using different parts of the Arboretum. And so we have clear spatial structure, flocks come and go, but they are derived from larger communities and those larger communities are geographically determined. What's really interesting, and this returns back to the uh, gorillas and the mist, except now we're gonna talk about another great ape, chimpanzees. What I've just described for golden crown sparrows is virtually identical to what was described for chimpanzees. And this is what I got from a review on chimpanzee social behavior. And I'll read it to you. We now know that chimpanzees live in a fission fusion society. Individuals form socially and geographically circumscribed unit groups or communities within which they associate in temporary subgroups or parties, which in our case would be flocks, that vary in size, composition, and duration. This seemingly clear cut picture of chimpanzee society did not emerge easily. They couldn't just go to the Arboretum and they're covering vast areas. But basically what we've described for chimpanzees here uh, is pretty much the same as what we found for uh, the sparrows. And in addition, uh, when they discovered this, they didn't have the same analytical tools. They didn't have social network theory to figure this out. And so not only were their data harder to get, uh, but to figure out what the patterns were um, was much uh, more difficult. And I want to point out what this means, the similarity in social organization of sparrows and chimpanzees does not mean that sparrows are smart like chimpanzees. What it means is some aspects of chimpanzee behavior are not really that complex. It means that what chimpanzees are doing are kind of like what sparrows are doing. And so it's good to separate out that some aspects of what these really smart primates are doing aren't necessarily a sign of genius, that they're shared with, we now know that these sort of patterns are shared with um, fish, birds, and various other things. And uh, Getting towards the end, um, what we found remarkably, we did this for three seasons, we found the same pattern across three seasons and the same communities reconstructed themselves and just let's take a moment and think what's going on here these are wintering birds that have come back so here's in winter one and we have these communities in between season one and season two these birds have gone up to the yukon and alaska bred and then migrated back so they are coming back after a full migration cycle and reconstituting these communities and it's typically the same returning individuals. So if you were best friends last year and both of your, and you're both alive, you will be best friends this year as well. And so that's, that's pretty remarkable. So um, what this means is that these birds are forming lifelong winter friendships um, for, especially for those that live a long time. And that, that's pretty remarkable. Um, and it was not something that we expected. And so an obvious question people often ask us is, wow, that's amazing that they have these long-term friends. Uh, they must be relatives. We did a genetic study. Uh, my former student, Nina Arnberg, did this work. And it turns out these social systems are not driven by relatedness. There are a few relatives in these populations, but the relatives are just as likely to be found in different groups, not the same groups. So whatever's going on here is the benefits of living in, living in groups and these friendships is not due to nepotism or relatedness. It's due to the friendship itself. Okay, and just to wrap up on a couple of last slides on where to next and what we know, uh, what we're hoping to do in the remaining few years of this study is to really integrate sort of the longer term uh, patterns of survivorship, social organization, plumage and song to sort of have an integrated understanding of the winter social behavior. And, um, one thing, this is now a bit out of date. I told you about our experiments with the sparrows being done with strangers to make sure that the birds didn't know each other. But then the question was, well, what happens if you repeat those uh, experiments with individuals from the same community that really know each other? Do, they, do those experiments still work? And uh, since making this slide, we've done that experiment and I can tell you, no. When birds really know each other, 
uh, they will not be fooled by a comb over. We can manipulate their plumage and that means that they're not paying attention anymore to the crown plumage of their friends. They actually know their friends and know what the pecking order is irrespective of the plumage type. I have a current PhD student, Theodora Block, who's done some lovely work on personalities. And she's just working that up now. It turns out that when you look at some of the behavioral um, aspects, and we've done this in Avery's, um, sparrows different, are, differ quite a bit in some of their personality traits, how fidgety they are, how much they explore, uh, whether they vocalize. And these are consistent uh, within sparrows, but differ across sparrows. And they're even consistent across years. So just as humans have sort of personality type behaviors, it seems that these uh, winter sparrows also have these sorts of uh, personality, quirky personality traits from bold to shy to nervous to quirky. Uh, and it's been, it's been pretty fun looking at this level of individuality. And then uh, last, as I mentioned, uh, the question is, are singers critical to community organization? And the way we're getting at that, and we're just working up the data now, is to try and integrate singing behavior with social network uh, uh, patterns to ask whether singers are key players, key members of the communities. There's, is song somehow playing a role in structuring these bizarre communities uh, that we see? And that's, stay tuned, that's something that uh, we should have an answer to in the next uh, several months. And I think that's it for my presentation. Um, Lara, so let me know if there's one before Lara's question. Uh, she asked, uh, would the golden crown sparrows diet explain why they perch and drink from hummingbird feeders? That's a great question. And I think it does because, because they're so vegetarian, um, they eat high quality grass tips, also a lot of nectar. And when you eat nectar, just as Orioles do, other things other than hummingbird that are used to eating nectar will come into feeders. So I think that, uh, I didn't know that they came into feeders, but it certainly makes perfect sense to me. Great. And this one's more of a comment from Emma, who says that they catch golden crown sparrows in Victoria, British Columbia, and they don't, they rarely see the more vibrant variations of crown pictured. Wow, that's really interesting. And um, you know, it might be a migration thing. So I don't know if you, if you have wintering birds of migration, but it's well known in migratory birds that you sometimes get patterns where the ages or the sexes go different distances and may even use different migration routes. So what you may be getting is, and I didn't tell you this, and uh, Rita, Rita Caldwell's work had showed this earlier and we're finding similar things, is there is both an age and a sex component to the plumage variation. Yearling birds tend to be very dull. Females can be quite bright, but they also tend to be dull, but there's also a lot of overlap. So, so on average, the sexes and the ages differ, but you can't use it really definitively to age them. But that might mean that they're getting mostly young birds, whoever's uh, reported that from Victoria, it could indicate that they're, they're picking up uh, young of the year. Cool, really interesting. Um, a more local question from someone who's, well, I don't know how local it is because everything is smoky. They said their garden is teeming with um, songbirds usually. This is from April. But yesterday's darkness due to smoke, it was very quiet. So uh, April wants to know if the birds might have thought it was nighttime or knew something was wrong and not singing. Yeah, I think that's been shown in, it, was, it felt like a full eclipse. And I think people have noticed that you can sometimes uh, get owls and things singing during an eclipse. So I suspect that they were fooled and they thought it was dusk. Um, now, whether they thought it was dusk or it was just scary and a high predation risk, I can't really say. I, as much as I've studied sparrows, I don't think like a sparrow yet. But yes, I think they would have been responding to the light level. Great. Another question from Lara and about um, when their neighbor is spraying pesticide or when there is smoke, a hummingbird will sit on top of a perch in a tree and click for 10 to 15 minutes. After hearing that, all the other birds will fly away and avoid the area until it has recovered. Could the hummingbird be communicating with other birds? And if so, is this type of interspecies communication common? I can't answer it. It would be unlikely to have that kind of particular um, 
vocalization, although I should say risk to predators, it's well known that birds uh, will communicate, but typically they wouldn't intentionally warn other species. It's more that the other species eavesdrop and have learned the alarm call. So if, if it's an alarm call that the, that the hummingbird is doing, this is possible, although I'm not sure that hummingbirds would actually have a reason to suspect anything about pesticides. So um, it might just be a, a, an interesting circumstance or coincidence. Yeah, maybe just the activity of the neighbor. Yeah. Um, there was a comment from Mac owner about the dark effect silencing birds and re referring to eclipses. And then another question about the uh, experiment, it's kind of interesting from Tom, is who wins if black patch is matched up against gold patch? That's a great question and we haven't done that yet. <laughs> um, although we might actually have that in our observational data. The problem with observational data is that they tend to not use their badges quite as much. But yeah, it's a good question. Okay. And, and we, we haven't done that experiment. Yeah, so C. John asks, um, so little about size and sex determines dominance? Say that again, I didn't, I didn't. Oh, I think the question is about whether size and sex determine dominance at all or impact it. Yes, uh, size does. Uh, if sex is matched for plumage, no. Females can uh, win against males, but since females tend to be a little bit duller, there may be sex differences. But given that a female is the same plumage brightness as a male, we actually looked at that, she's just as likely to win a, to win a fight. Great. Or be dominant, I should say. They're not really, yeah. they don't fight right. that much. Um, a comment from Sherry about Galapagos mockingbirds, that they don't migrate. Maybe that relates to the stability of their groups. Yes, uh, they're cooperative breeders and most cooperative breeders uh, are year-round residents. For example, are acorn woodpeckers. I, I, I could have shown, if I'd had a good picture of acorn woodpeckers, I could have shown them. They have the same very stable structure and they are year-round residents. Yes, that's a great point. Regina asks, if you washed out the added coloring, would the bird's behavior go back to what it was originally, I guess, in terms of winning fights? Absolutely. And in fact, we did wash the, we did wash the, the, the stuff off before we released them. And so um, they, would, they would lose their respect, basically. If you wash it, they'd go back to, uh, I think, although there might be a legacy effect, it'd be interesting to sort of, if they become full of themselves for a while, uh, until they get challenged. What, what Siebert Rohr found with the hair sparrows is if you dye the birds, give them a black bib, he actually used a, a hair dye, I think. They win fights, but eventually they get found out. So there's testing. And at some point, someone calls BS on them and they start to get beaten up. So you can, you can only fool them for so long. And, and, and that also raises the question that they might sort of then carry that. If, you, if they get respect, they might go out in the wild and think they've got respect for a while and then go, oops, maybe I will, maybe I'll tone it down. Yeah. Um, are they recognizing their friends or reacting to their friends' behavior, being dominant, for example? That's a really good question. And it's clear. And, and in the sort of the, the animal thinking literature, it's do they really recognize the individuals or do they are they doing something else? So it's like, it's not like, hey, you're Bill the Sparrow. It's like, oh, you're, you, you got this feathery type thing. We actually think that they recognize individuals, although we can't prove it. We, when we published a paper on this, this was some criticism was raised. It was like, oh, it's really hard to show that they actually recognize individuals. But I would be willing to bet a bottle of single malt whiskey that they recognize each, each other. They just, they come back year after year after year. I think the problem with, with the assumption that they don't recognize each other is it, it, it makes it seem like, oh, humans are so special because we can recognize our friends. You know, our pets recognize that. My cat recognizes me, it recognizes my, my voice. Uh, anybody who's got dogs and cats knows that they recognize not just each other, but another, individuals of another species. So I, I'm pretty sure they recognize individuals. Jan wants to know if the black and gold patterns stay consistent over the years. Excellent question. And I've just repeated that um, result. And yes, but with a catch. 
So there's a big jump from yearling to second year. Yearlings are dull, and then you get a generate. Some birds will stay dull for their whole life, and then some become very bold. And then they're really, really consistent. I've got, we've got photos, so I can line up photos across years. And they're very consistent from year two on. And when you see that kind of consistency, one explanation is this is genetic variation. So it would not shock me if there's heritable variation in plumage traits across individuals. So that kind of heritable variation has been found in other species. And so again, I'd be willing to bet that there's some genetic variation in the same, which raises the question about what else, why is that heritable variation maintained? What's the, what's the, what's, why isn't everybody bold? Yep, lots to investigate. Have you matched summer territories with winter territories for the communities? We tried that and it was a epic fail. We um, had trouble with our harnesses and we, because they now have GPS tags that give exact measurement. As long as you can get the tags back, you can then figure out where birds went in summer. And despite a pretty massive effort, two things worked against us. It seems like the harnesses didn't stay on mm -hmm. and the Arboretum uh, erased most of the habitat that we were using where we did the big banding study without telling us. They put in a parking lot and we had invested tagging a boatload of sparrows. So we were not happy campers about that. Uh, so we tried. Um, with the four bird get from, um, there's not a clear link between summer and winter, but it's a very weak test. So uh, um, with the point blue people that are doing tagging studies and maybe they'll get, I think they've had higher return rates. So maybe they'll be able to do what we weren't able to do. Okay, a question from Betty. Won't all sparrows develop the 5AC crown before they leave in the spring? Yes. Um, what's re remarkable is these birds don't vary much in summer. I think males might be a little bolder, but when they molt before they leave, they all become super, super uh, bold in both yellow and black, which is a breeding uh, signal, which means given the consistency we've seen in winter that these birds, some birds are putting on this super bold breeding plumage and then when they come back in the fall they've already molted back into a really dull one. So there's some, some of these birds are really changing a lot each year consistently between summer and winter. And to me that's pretty interesting. Great. More questions about coloration from Max. Has head coloration been studied in other sparrows like white crown sparrows to see if it serves a similar behavior? Perfect. Yes, it's been studied in hair sparrows as I said but that was the bib. It's some excellent studies in white crown sparrows. They've been some really detailed studies and yes, it serves as a badge of status uh, in white crown sparrows. And a comment from Mikal, I'm a rehabber, so I raise many orphan birds of wild species. I clearly see personality differences from two or three days old. Pretty impressive. Oh, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. Actually, I'm, I'm, as uh, Yue mentioned, I'm on a, a wood duck study and one of the students has been doing personality in ducklings. I'm less involved in that actual aspect of the study, but there are clear personalities in newly hatched wood ducklings that you pick really up cool. from that. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. All right. So another question. We'll see how quickly you can answer this one for Max. What is the hypothesized benefit for golden crown sparrows existing in a fusion fission society? We don't know. Um, the communities, the question we have is why are there communities? The fission fusion, I think what's going on there is the birds that, that the home ranges are small enough for these birds that they call back and forth. So even if they're not in a flock, they kind of know where the rest of the community is. And so the flocks come and go because, you know, you can hang out with this group or that group and they move back and forth between the flocks. And so it may be that it doesn't really matter um, who you're with, as long as you're with sort of a friend from the community. Uh, and we can't yet address that. We don't know exactly why it pays to have such a, a strong community. We can speculate. If you're forming lifelong uh, partnerships with some of these birds, you can trust them. They're going to not try and stab you in the back, you're going to both look up for uh, together and various things like that. And so, but, but again, that's just speculation. 
And the fusion fission part, it might just be that it doesn't matter who you're with at any point in time, as long as they're from your community. Okay, another community question from Rachel. First, she says, amazing presentation, thank you. I was wondering what the definition of communities mean and whether they were geographically separated because of physical obstacles like hills and trees or it was open space. That's such a good question. Um, and community is just the name we came up with to describe those clear globs, those units that stand out as discrete. Um, it doesn't seem like there's uh, geographic barriers and the person, the brains behind the social network analysis was my colleague, uh, uh, Dai Shizuka. He became an expert on this and he developed ways to really dig down into the data and ask whether these communities occur simply because these birds are all using the same exact space or are these communities a reflection of social bonds that go beyond the fact that they use the same space. And he was able to show that social bonds are important. You can't, so not all birds use all part of the home range and, but they're still coming together. So, that, so he did some sophisticated analysis to show that they're hanging out because they're friends, not just because they're on the same group territory. And then those group territories themselves don't seem to be determined by any kind of barriers we can detect. Again, it seems like it's a social thing, although song may play a role in keeping communities apart. I mean, one question is like, why do the birds not go into each other's sort of uh, group territories as much as you might expect? And we don't have an answer to that. Yeah, okay, great. Um, this question you might have addressed earlier or similarly. Amy says, posture and body size, are they factors in dominance as well? I can imagine they are, but that's, we need to do some pretty um, serious visual uh, video analysis uh, posture will certainly, they put their head down and they threaten. And sometimes when we see outright fights, they will display the crown. And to, to me, I, I interpret that as a threat. And if size is important, they might, they sometimes also will emerge when they're threatening, will stand up as tall as they can. And that may be a way of just saying how big I am. So absolutely, I think that posture and sort of uh, display uh, type might be important. We just haven't studied it. Okay, Amy follows up with another question. Does dominance change when they change into breeding plumage? In our yard, they all changed. We um, have not studied that, but it would be, the problem is for two things. It would complicate things because then they've changed their plumage, but they're also, when they're changing their plumage, they're molting and they're going through pretty big uh, hormonal shifts. And so things get kind of out of whack. Um, but they're also, because they're molting, they're a lot shyer and harder to study, possibly because it's a stressful time for them. So they, um, um, we haven't really looked at that, but it, it, it's something we could do. Okay, so from Francisco, do singing birds from the same micro populations share a song dialect different from the neighbor population? No, because unlike white crown sparrows, these guys don't have much in the way of dialect structure. There's a little bit, but um, it, in terms of there's a little bit, there's, we sometimes pick up a four syllable dialect that's more common in the foothills, but uh, typically um, they all sound pretty similar. Part of the problem is too, is some of them seem um, really bad singers. It turns out that sing clear songs with three syllables, the O oh, poor me. Other ones are pathetic and sing a scratchy single syllable song. And from Jacob, for your network analysis, you said, oops, sorry, I just scroll down. You said you use a 10 meter distance for flock inclusion. I was wondering what the effect of reducing or increasing that distance would make on the results. Might you get smaller sub communities if you shorten the distance? I don't think we would, um, we would just get, I, I think that the, the um, thing would be robust to that. What it means is we might not be counting birds. Smaller than that would, would not make sense. I mean, because they're really moving around. I, I don't think we could actually collect those data. Larger is a concern because there might be birds that actually are sort of hanging around that are part of that flock. Um, and the fact that we still pick up really clear communities means that that's not uh, affecting 
our ability to include those in the same community. And the fact that it's geographically circumscribed, I, my sense is that would not really fundamentally change things. Um, well, great. I think that's it. So thanks again, Bruce, for doing the talk. Thanks for everyone um, for sticking around and sticking through any technical difficulties. Thank, thank you all for making the long trip from your living room to your computer.